Pennsylvania. Uh, I, I co-organised a, a series of sessions on, on scale and urban governance, all the cool topics back then. Um, and those, those sessions were co-organised with Deb Martin and Mark Purcell. And we were lucky that Pauline submitted a paper for, for one of those sessions. She eventually published a paper, uh, or that paper, in, in a special issue of the Journal of Urban Affairs that Deb and Mark and I uh, co-edited. The paper's title was uh, Producing the Capacity to Govern in Global Sydney, a Multi-Scale Account. And, it, and I, I, I suppose in a way it, sh it really shows uh, her long-standing commitment to analysing the politics of urban governance and its changing forms across decades and across continents. From her long-time home in New South Wales uh, to her native Dublin. Pauline earned three degrees from Trinity College Dublin. 20 year degrees, I'm sure she's never heard that before. <laughs> culminating, culminating in a PhD in, two, in 1992. Her doctoral research explored how urban planning in Dublin was made compliant to the demands of neoliberalised capitalism. Um, soon after her doctorate, she moved to Australia and spent a good part of her career at the University of Newcastle, uh, which is north of Sydney, including a long stint as director of the University's Centre for Urban and Regional Studies. Her high quality research has garnered a number of awards over the years, including election as a fellow of the Australian Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, that was in 2016, just at the time that she departed Newcastle and moved south to the University of Wollongong. Uh, and there at Wollongong, she is Senior Professor in the School of Geography and Sustainable Communities and is also Director of the Australian Centre of Culture, Environment, Society and Space. Pauline's uh, consistent research agenda through these years addresses what she describes as the changing practices, politics and spatialities of urban governance. Her current work focuses, focuses to a great extent on the management of social, technological and environmental change in cities and in urban regions. These interests have led her, to, uh, led her and her co-authors to engage in, in an ongoing critical investigation of innovation, experimentation, best practices in what might be called solutionism or solutioneering in contemporary governments. It's that work that, she, that we are going to hear about today. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are too. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Pauline to SFU Geography. Just to make sure I stick to time. So in 2015, 
Steen in his book on the idea of innovation. Benoit Godin wrote about the aura and legitimacy that the concept of innovation has generated as a mindset across economy and politics. And I think this is especially true of urban politics and relatedly of urban governance. Certainly the wider calls for an imperative to innovate, to address a suite of complex societal, economic, environmental challenges has, has very much focused on the urban in recent years. Most recently, the late Clive Barnett has remarked on what he called the task responsabilization of cities for solving complex societal problems. And certainly organizations like the UN, the OECD, global philanthropies, global consulting firms, not-for-profits, they've all been prescribing urban governance innovation as essential to building the capacity to provide these solutions through city governments. And a kind of influential epistemic community has emerged around codifying and promoting um, urban governance innovation. I'm just going to call it UGI from now on because I'll trip over the nine syllables in urban governance innovation if I don't. So with this epistemic community, there has come this articulation of a suite of best practices um, that are being promoted and promulgated around how to do best practice UGI. Um, what we've been doing uh, in our work is, is initially to try and scope out what these, what these are and how they're represented. So there's a set of principles for UGI that are about embracing experimentation and the willingness to fail, um, much wider collaborations across silos within government, wider collaborations with communities, philanthropies, the private sector, and so on. And that's framed around a kind of a, a start-up ethos around agility, iterating, speed, those kinds of tropes. There's also a set of approaches that are articulated, most prominently, most prominently design thinking in its various iterations, co-design, co-production, and human-centered design but also prototyping data analytics. And there's also then a bunch of mechanisms, institutional mechanisms, especially innovation units or iLabs, innovation offices, um, challenge competitions, accelerators, there's a suite of mechanisms that are, are out there as, as codified best practice. And all of this has been proliferating as UGI is taking shape as a kind of creative problem, problem solving. That's the rhetoric. So our project, the ARC project I mentioned, is premised on the idea that there's a kind of uncharted potential in all of this to quite dramatically reconfigure urban governance, to reconfigure the composition of the actors that are authorized to govern, to reconfigure the constitution of governance, its methods, its mechanisms, its materiality, and also to reconfigure the politics of urban governance arguably opening up quite a broad spectrum and scope of political ambition that sits behind these initiatives and, and institutions. So in our project we've been trying to get to grips with all of this, to, to think about the, the emerging dispositif that is being reshaped around UGI and the politics and possibilities that are travel with that. So we've been trying to scope it empirically through international examples, We've been trying to look at the key approaches and challenges and how they work. And we've also been moving towards trying to theorize all of this, to theorize these shifts and what it might mean in terms of reworking urban politics. In 2022, we published a piece in Progress of Human Geography. And this is my first attempt to generate a sound cloud ever. That's a sound, it's, not a, it's a, word, a word cloud, not a sound cloud. A word cloud from the paper on the left. Um, and in that paper, we set out a broad critical agenda that we think is really important for this field going forward. And in this paper today, we're, we're trying to inch towards contributing in some way towards this broad agenda, but certainly not all of it. So that's the context for where this paper comes from, the paper I brought in the seminar. The paper itself is currently on review, so it's still very much, much at the stage where your input would be welcome and help us um, refine or perhaps reject some of our arguments, or very open to that. All right. So the kicking off point for the paper itself is the fact that in recent years, cities and city governments have been positioned at the core of this imperative to innovate, to address complex societal problems, especially those that find intense expression in the urban. 
And as I said, this kind of uh, international epistemic community has emerged that's um, been releasing a stream of globally circulated best practice guides and articulating a set of pathways to the successful implementation of governance innovation. So there are reports, playbooks, uh, best practice manual toolkits, there are capacity building events, there are showcases, some of which are captured here. And the types of innovation being promoted here, in turn, is assumed to lead to the creation of better cities, more sustainable, more equitable, livable, inclusive. So the pathways and best practices being articulated here have been hungrily absorbed by local governments, urban local governments around the world, to the extent that they've become what Lindsay Cole has called the default implicit theory informing their work. Now what we do in the paper and what I'll do in the talk today is to think about how the ideal type pathways and the best practices that constitute those pathways, how do they actually gel with the actual practice of urban governance innovation on the ground? And we do that as a kind of pivot to two things. The first is to argue and to substantiate with the empirical work we've been doing that enactments of urban governance innovation are less coherent, less steerable, or determinable than the notion of pathways in firm. So we argue that there's a real need to come to grips with UGI in practice through a kind of a grand theorization. There's a lot of rhetoric and suppositions, of course, in these kinds of reports that we argue needs to be taken further. And the second thing I want to do is put forward the bones of such a theorization. So what I want to talk about and try and flesh out with our empirics is the importance of understanding urban governance innovation in terms of three things, relationality, navigation, and situatedness. And I'll come back to those as the three kind of pivot points of our theorization as I go through. So first, a word on what some of these articulations and pathways actually do. Now these are the tables from the paper itself. If anyone really, really wants to look at the detail in the paper, um, what we've got here is just kind of the key um, coordinates of the principles, the practices, and the mechanisms, and just indicative examples of the reports that are out there that illustrate these. These outputs, I think, are um, influential. They become these sort of sources of expertise and instruction on innovative governance practice. They codify a sort of a best practice repertoire for delivering UGI. To quote the OECD, they, and I'm quoting here, they create new knowledge about possibilities, creativity of thought, and operationalization of innovations that are aimed to destabilize all practices and to normalize new ways of thinking and doing governance. The second thing that they do is they emphatically center the urban as a critical locus for governance innovation. And key to our argument, the third thing that they do is they very often um, <coughs> represent the codifications in terms of pathways, strategically oriented, more or less coherent, staged pathways to UGI. As the, and, and the message is you get on this pathway and you have the coordinates for delivering better cities through innovation. Some of you might be familiar with some of these. The one on the left is, is a really familiar one to people in the innovation field. It's Nesta's Innovation Spiral. And a more recent example on the right is the nine-step culture cascade developed by the Bloomberg and Harvard City Leadership Initiative. So, so these are the, the kind of pathways that are out there. In how they're iterated, they very often do acknowledge the need to be customized to local context and local culture. But taken as a whole, I guess it's, a, it's an issue of their format, they inevitably have to lean towards abstraction and they have to lean towards linearity and they produce this kind of generically applicable objective knowledge. And that means, of course, that what gets less implicit is the context sensitive working out of UGI on the ground, the frictions that have to be navigated when these ideal type pathways hit the ground. What these documents tend to do most often is they give a kind of proof of concept success story or multiple success stories as these exemplar case studies. And they present the innovation process through this kind of technocratic common sense. So a, a technocratic logic seeps in, along with a sense of methodological solutionism. You know, apply the right method and you'll solve your, your own problem. 
problem. And you'll eventually get better cities. This includes an assumption that's captured in the quotation from Bloomberg philanthropies here that successful governance innovation depends on the involvement of a range of players, based of city agencies, county, state, national governments, not for profits, chamber of commerce, community groups, to leverage one another's influence to get the job done. So there's this strong sense that reconcilable interests and common values will draw all of these actors together onto a coherent and consensual pathway to change. Now while these pathways might be useful strategic catalysts for innovation, and they might be useful for friendly general approaches, they have less to say about the situated enactment of UGI, where we argue that politics really reside. They have very little to say about the tensions and the trade-off, the trade-offs that are involved in delivering on urban government's innovation and its potential to pursue progressive politics. In our own work in other areas, we found that attempts to transform urban governance, and our work's been about transforming it for smart cities and transforming it around energy transition. In that work, we found that um, intentional governance transformations, rather than being achieved through these intentional predetermined pathways and best practices, tend to be enacted relationally. They tend to be advanced through the navigation of relations that are encountered in situated contexts. So back to my three terms, relationality, navigation, and situatedness. And we argue that the same is true when it comes to urban governance innovation. The process, this bit is kind of a spoiler to where I'm going, the process involves not so much the smooth rolling out of planned coherent pathways as it does pragmatic navigations to negotiate situated contexts, contestations, obstructions, and to be able to cohere together the wider array of actors, elements, and capacities that are necessary to enact the initiatives associated with innovating. So it's much more aligned in an imaginary sense with Limblom's idea of modeling through rather than following strategic pathways. So that's kind of the spoiler of where I'm going to go with this, but what is it based on? Well, we developed our argument uh, by iterating between a couple of what is a theory that I'll um, elaborate on in a moment and empirical observations from a set of international interviews and documentary analyses we've done with about 20 urban-based innovation units um, internationally. Now, these innovation units have lots of different names. They can be called innovation labs or iLabs. They can be called innovation offices. Lots of different names. I'll just call them innovation units. It's a muddy category too, so it's quite hard to pin down exactly um, the different variants that exist. But the idea of a dedicated office for innovation has been something of a poster child in the best practices that the epistemic community have been um, promulgating. And the number of city-funded, city-focused innovation units have been increasing rapidly over the last um, couple of decades. This comes from a piece of work done in the John Hopkins uh, Bloomberg Center for Public Innovation. We've been tracking these offices around the world, increasing from one that they found in 2008 to well over 100 now, and it's, you know, it's a money category that's growing all the time. As units, they tend to be positioned with the special purpose of a dedicated purpose of trying to disrupt what are seen as what is seen as the, the bureaucratic stifling of ideas and creativity in local governments. They're seen as vehicles for developing the capacity to enact innovation and, and to do governance differently. In the urban context, they are most often fairly small units and they're most often located within municipalities. And that's the case for all 20, actually 19 of the 20 that we did. Whatever the precise name, whether it's an office, a lab, a unit, they tend to have this agreement as intentional change agents. They're licensed to generate, to test, and to deploy non-traditional governance practices with a widening array of partners within and beyond the state. They generally talked about as this kind of institutional safe space where experimentation and failure is normalized and where new governance ideas can be kind of de-risked, or well, generated in the first place, then de-risked and tested and learned from. 
In practice, they pursue a really wide, wide range of purposes and have a really wide array of politics behind them. Sort of a spectrum that goes from fairly simply trying to improve the efficiency and effectiveness uh, or the user friendliness of local government and its services, right through to much more transformative, much more disruptive kind of um, approaches. So we've taken them to be a really productive entry point for looking at this question and for trying to build our theory around. The cohort that we examined is international, mainly in the US and Canada, but also Australia, Italy, Iceland and Ireland. The iteration there was accidental, for all of the I countries. They range across working on some really ambitious projects like cracking the housing affordability crisis, um, or transforming citizen participation in governance through to much more simple sort of reimagining uh, local service needs or more routine refinements to how local services get developed. So it's a big spectrum of purposes and politics. But if I turn to the theoretical touch points for the, the work we're doing here, we've got two key theoretical touch points. The first is a body of recent work on urban, uh, governing urban sustainability transition. And that's work that's engaged quite critically with the idea of pathways to innovation. So work of people like Laura Tozer, Matt Patterson, Jacob Grandin, Dan Rosenblum. Their work very strongly suggests that pathways are not these predetermined routes that give us these smooth arcs towards future goals. But routes to innovation, they argue, unfold relationally over time and with far less certain or predictable outcomes. They eventuate from what Matt Patterson terms an unfolding series of moments requiring interpretation and decision making in uncertainty, often without any guarantee of clear or satisfactory outcomes. So that's our first touch point. The second one comes from recent theorizations of heterodox forms of urban governance innovation, mainly from urban political geography, and chiefly associated with lots of new work that's been coming out on new municipalism. A recent mega special edition of urban studies has been really helpful here. So it's the work of people like Bertie Russell, Yolanda Bianchi, Ismail Blanco, Mauro Pinto, and Matt Thompson. That new municipalism work focuses on the more radical kind of transformation-oriented institutional innovations. So building on these two bodies of work, we argue that understanding urban governance innovation needs to go much further than these pathways and best practices. It needs to attend to the work that goes into trying to draw together and hold together the new combinations of actors and capacities to enact innovation, and they need to attend to the crucial moments of situated navigation that really determines whether things here, congeal into something more permanent and, and transformative, or whether they slip away. So the next thing I want to do is kind of tease out the dynamics of urban governance innovation in each of the terms that are key to us, the relational, the navigational, and the situated. And we'll do that through the lens of the innovation units that we've worked on. So in terms of relationality, as I've said, our argument is that enacting UGI involves multiple interventions that destabilize existing ways of practice and so need to draw together these diverse sets of elements to, to make the capacity to innovate. So bringing together new actors, new techniques, new mechanisms. And here we might see new forms of institutions like long or accelerators. We might see new sources of authority, new behaviours, co-production for instance, maybe new legal and financial techniques all having to be drawn together. We get a bit of a flavour of some of that diverse, the, diver, the diversity of elements involved in this quotation. This is a narration from one of our um, interviewees in a California-based um, innovation lab that gives, I think, a sense of the, the actors, the elements, the techniques that are all needing to be created and drawn together gathered together. So he talks about teams, various types of actors from the public sector, the non-profits, startup companies, using the iteration of problem statements, giving pitches, requests for quotations, drawing in and um, vendors and so on. So that's really just to give a flavour of the diversity of things and people and capacities that need to be 
brought together. But I think a bit more intriguing is the work that has to be done, not just to draw these actors and elements together, but to stabilize and normalize them working together so that the new practices are authorized. Because as one interviewee put it, baking and innovation in doesn't necessarily mean it stays baked in. It takes work to make it stick and stay. And we found that there are these social and material elements to that making it stick. For instance, um, collaborating with lots of diverse partners across silos within government, or working with the private sector, or working with philanthropies. And this is all core to urban government's innovation. And it requires the crafting and the holding together of new relationships. Our interviewees talked a lot about the importance of trust and persuasion as really crucial to stabilizing these new relationships between actors that are unfamiliar with and often sherry of working together. One of our interviewees put it beautifully, I think, when he said, well, we started by doing projects, but we didn't have the relationships first, and everyone was getting pissed off. So we started building relationships first. Trust and social networks turn out to be the greatest lubricant for innovation. So our theory of change is build relationships. So trust and persuasion, vital. But material elements were also important to nurturing the new habits and the new dispositions that are important to holding these actors and elements together. Material space provided a kind of relational glue that was key to enabling relational ways of working. The second quotation here comes from one of our Australian interviewees in a context where they have a physical space, a city lab where they do very openly, literally, with glass windows onto a street, where they do their innovating work. She says, well, we have a well-fitted out space that supports our way of working. Now that we're seeing more people come in and really activating that, it's a way that people can access our way of working. We've got the Lego play sets and all of those sorts of things that can help people use our creative way of working in their own work. So they literally had physical Lego blocks in the room, they had all of the signifiers around the room, the space, the materiality, the social innovations, that uh, social relations of the space, they mark out that space as a site for innovation and suture new relationships in place through that. But equally, visualizations and other kinds of persuasive demonstrations were really important to demonstrate the, the supposed co-benefits of innovation, to suture those relations together, and often to ward off criticism as well. So one of our uh, interviewees talked very nicely about this, where he said, I go through a lot of pain, well not pain, but a lot of effort for how we communicate. We make sure we're telling a, compel a compelling narrative of how we are advancing innovation in the city. With the website, with the blog, where we show our work and we show all the cool things that we do. And that word cool, in fact, was used repeatedly through our interviews with, with urban bureaucrats being really keen to try to get the message out that urban bureaucracy is cool, <laughs> does cool things, um, key to, to kind of attracting different types of people. So this narrating and making sense of innovation unit practices are important, not just externally to kind of convince a public that this is a good thing to be doing, but to secure that internal buy-in within the organisation as well. So all of our units put lots and lots of effort and resources into showcasing the wins. Endless reporting, exhibits, social media, websites to sort of convince the case that innovation is good, or worthwhile at least. These examples, I think, highlight that relational work that is required to craft innovation, to draw the actors together, to hold them together, to, to make things endure. And it's what Lindsay Cole has called innovation theatre that's needed to destabilize existing practices and then cohere the new sets of actors and, and other elements that are here. <coughs> so that's relationality. Let me turn to navigation. The new relational assemblages that I'm talking about here are, and I'm quoting Jens, Jens Jensen here, they're seldom informed by a preconceived consensus-driven strategic pathway, unquote. Instead, they require pragmatic navigation 
around place-based circumstances. This is constant navigation around gaps in resources, navigation around challenges, frictions and obstacles that emerge around trying to innovate. And this isn't a technocratic exercise. None of the navigations are guaranteed to work, They're not necessarily guaranteed to have effective outcomes. One idea we found useful in thinking about this is Matt Patterson's work, where he draws attention to how moments of navigation around innovation circle around what he calls junctures, where ambiguities and tensions come to the surface. And these might be tensions between incumbent and emergent interests, competing expectations and responsibilities, institutional cultures, material conditions, uh, politics, money, the whole lot, all of which has to be juggled and negotiated. So trying to think in terms of junctures, in our work we could identify four recurring types of junctures where navigation was necessary and inevitable. The first was around institutional complexity. All of the manoeuvring that had to go on around the intricacies of competing interests, especially within municipal governments. One innovation team from the US context, where the mayor is a very powerful environment, it's very different to the context of Australia, they narrated for us the shifting course they had to chart to try to secure their funding. Because their team was called the mayor's innovation team, and the rest of the council hated that. So he said, for us, it was just that the city council doesn't believe in us. They believe we're the mayor's innovation team. So every year we just cut our funding. So we changed the name of the team, we just dropped from the head of the name. Um, the name change helped us a lot. Our funding was never in jeopardy after that. So very simple and successful navigation. For others, it was much more challenging to try to steer their way through these um, complexities, um, to try to get to do their best practice innovation and to reset um, priorities. As one of them said, when we wanted to move into lining up our innovations with these really urgent problems that are politically fraught and have tons of competing interests, that was much more difficult to make that transition. So they failed in this instance. So this is really about how innovation units have to pilot their way, their kind of fluid position, through an unruly political and institutional complex, uh, complex of landscape that's shaped by the stickiness of habitual ways of doing things, the ways things have always been done, and by the kind of moves and counter moves of people trying to innovate and people wanting things to perhaps remain as they have been. So institutional complexity a really big one across all of our examples. Second was the old chestnut of uh, navigating resources, getting their money, getting their budget, getting their people dedicated to them year in, year out. So even though innovation units have this kind of iconic status as best practice, as the kind of the poster child of promulgating the GI, they still have to fight year on year to secure their ongoing resourcing, financial and human. And this means they have to come up against every year uh, the, the things, the, the multiple demands on city finances that tends to stifle the investment in innovation process. So there's always this friction around um, a local government having to do what it has to do and still find budget for these other projects. Um, nicely put here by one of our uh, interviewees, there are some things in city government like sending out utility bills and fixing potholes. Um, you can't not do those things. Filling up potholes was a recurrent trope between these researchers and it, that it never goes away. When it comes down to what he said, there's a budget. And part of the reason we couldn't fill the innovation director role was because of that budget. We just didn't have the resources to fill it and have a balanced budget. So there's the constant negotiation of resources. Next was the navigation of the changed relationship between the city and the citizen. Now UGI often aspires to producing more inclusive participation in governance. And that often means trying to map new routes between top-down governance styles and more participatory approaches like co-production. And it involves kind of shaping new subjectivities for citizens. For this one, you need to imagine a rich Italian accent, which I'm not going to attempt, but this is one of our European interviews. 
And here he navigated what has to be, or he narrated for us what has to be navigated in his context, where they're really trying to push a much more participatory involvement with their local citizens. He said the municipality want to continue to use the classical approach, hierarchical, with decisions top down, and with enormous bureaucracy problems. But we know that people don't want to trust us. At the same time, we know that there's a possibility to clarify, to invent a new relation. But we have to conquest the brain and the heart of the public citizen. We have to move forward looking for a new relation with our citizen, going outside the institution and the, the conventional institutional approaches. And all of this can bring to the surface what Bianchi has called conflictual collaborative tensions that will constantly need to be navigated. So contending interests, different expectations, etc., etc. The, the everyday stuff of doing governance, really. It doesn't go away in urban governance innovation. And a final recurring conjuncture involved navigating resistance to change, resistance to urban governance innovation, from city officials embedded in routinized practices and cultures and finding themselves confronted by uh, the novelty that was coming at them. As advocates of UGI, innovation units often have to plot this course of trying to push innovation in a context where there might be other structural changes also going on that can trigger just a, a flat rejection to any further change. And there's a real echo here from me in um, university restructuring. You know, we all find ourselves caught in another restructure. And I think that's beautifully captured in um, our first quotation here, where she's talking about she says, our, our internal structures had already been moving for six or seven months, and people were still trying to find their rhythm and settle into their new roles. Teams were trying to uh, work out how to work. And then we came in, this new team came in, this new outside structure that we're supposed to share. And people were just like, why? What? It just innovation exhaustion, change exhaustion. But even in the absence of structural change, Existing governance practices are embedded in conventional, have habitual ways of doing things, in the rules and the values that people can resist letting go of. Um, and this was characterized quite neatly by one of our uh, American-based innovation leaders where she said, culture change is really hard. There's no getting around it. We've had a lot of success in pockets, and some of those pockets are big pockets, whole departments that love this way of thinking and have embraced it, but some of those pockets are really small, one employee. So our key point here, I think, is that collectively, these four kinds of junctures, they represent these recurrent sticking points and tensions across individuals, interests, cultures, structures that have to be continually navigated in a dynamic context. And they echo really nicely the challenges that the new municipalists and scholars have identified in their emerging work about this everyday prosaic internal relations and contradictions in local government that have to be worked through to, to uh, drive change. And I think crucially, the outcomes of these navigations, whether they succeed, where they land, that uh, determines whether the attempt to place innovative practices revert to the conventional, or whether these ongoing navigations can convert in, in innovation into a new way of doing things, a new ordering of how to govern. So how these junctures are navigated are crucial, I think, but they're also crucial to shaping the purposes that innovation can attempt to achieve, and important to shaping its political potential, its possibility. But we don't think that the kind of technocratic logic and the rationalistic knowledge that we find in the best practice guides and the pathways is, is really well equipped or attuned or to capturing these kind of navigations and all of the ambiguities and the trade-offs that happen in this space. So lastly, I want to turn to situatedness. Now, I always find, find it a bit odd to talk to geographers about situatedness because we're generally already converts to the fact that situation matters, place matters context matters, um, other parts of public policy and the public policy world less so. So the last thing I want to talk to is the unavoidable situatedness of the relations and navigations that we're talking about. In the urban sustainable transitions work that we're, we're drawing on, Matt Patterson talks about a continuous landscape of judgments in practice 
that shape governance innovation in non-ideal, real-world settings. And Jacob of Grandin emphasizes the situated complexities and contingencies that ultimately determine how specific governance innovations work or don't work. For him, and I'm quoting here, situatedness explains the gap between the contested, fragmented, and temporary nature of many urban governance arrangements on the one hand, and the idea of coherent pathways on the other. And that idea is, is strongly echoed in, again, the work of the new municipalism scholars, as they emphasize the irreducible nature of place-specific conditions and political contingencies that produce these tensions between interests as they're trying to craft innovation initiatives. So outcomes are always situated, always indeterminate. Geographical context really matters. And it can be either enabling of innovation or constraining of innovation. But certainly all of this is, is quite away from the kind of smooth imaginary of following a pathway to, to innovate. Our interviewees pointed to a range of local contingencies that shape the judgments and practice they have to make. The quotations on the slide suggest some of these were inhibiting, including um, the importance of the way that the primacy, the immediacy of local needs tends to overwhelm the principles of wanting to innovate. One interviewee described how his office had to abandon an attempt to take on what he called the big thorny issues that demanded working across multiple departments. He said we shifted away from that model because it was more of a need to have a sort of a smaller project-based model. It allowed for more flexibility, right-sizing our change effort to whatever it was the city was already doing. In the US context particularly, the specifics of the priorities of the mayors was a really defining driver of, of what was allowed to happen. One was an example, this bottom example is where a new mayor was about to come into place and our innovation unit person said to us, look, our in initiative as it stands is probably going to look very different. I mean, you know, the new mayor wants to come in and sort of put their own spin on things. I'm hopeful that we can keep some of the kind of work alive in the form that we've been championing it here, but it remains to be seen. Again, situation constraining what might be done. And another dynamic of situatedness was the, the, the sort of path dependencies that come from the historical political context that shapes how receptive actors are and how receptive the public is to uh, innovations being introduced. One of our interviewees from one of the southern states in the US said, but we're a 300-year-old city steeped in tradition. We're a racially segregated city. And so there's a desire by some in power to say, we should keep things the way they are. The city itself, as you might imagine, was a heavily conservative Republican city. So that created issues like, oh God, here are these guys coming in with the social services, spending tons of money to do this innovation thing. So that was the push. So again, constraining. But, there are also instances in which situated contexts can be enabling. We found examples when innovation units were able to push ahead with existing agendas for governance change that they had by opportunities that arose when innovation brand funding was released, sometimes by philanthropies wanting to sponsor urban governance innovation. So in my final example, we've got an instance here where the philanthropy was offering this um, city and a group of cities uh, potential money to advance government's innovation. And our, our interview said, look, we've been doing this for over five years now. We've been poking, poking, knocking on doors, knocking on doors, being sometimes really obnoxious. But we just argued to the philanthropy that we have all the foundations, we have the building blocks, and now we just want to use this opportunity to expand and to be able to look at the bigger picture. That's why we need this, that's why we need the resources. So these contextual determinants shape the purposes of UDI, how they, how they figure out um, how they land in the end, um, shapes UGI's purposes. It shapes the room that's there for the room. It shapes the form of institutional might actually take root. That is, if they shape the political possibilities of what innovation can bring. 
And certainly they point to the need for moving past this rhetoric of smooth pathways uh, lined with best practice, um, best practices for innovation. So let me draw to a conclusion here. In this work, what we've been drawn to is what Nagorni Corey calls the messy batch, backstage work of NGI. And we think this messy backstage needs to be understood to take us much further than the kind of ideal type of cohesive, steerable stage pathways. Even as we accept that these pathways do important work in legitimizing innovation, in catalyzing it, sometimes in resourcing action towards renewing our moments. But for us, an alternative kind of understanding or theorizing is necessary that is able to attend to the new relations that need to be drawn together, that recognizes the ongoing need for just having to navigate these junctures, and for accepting the inevitable situatedness of these navigations that can never be extracted from or smoothed over. So this gives us, we hope, this approach, this kind of approach at least, gives us a framework that can give us a more compelling analysis of how urban governance innovation tends to be quite disjointed. It can be. Um, it's full of constraint, it's full of contingency, contestation, and complexity. Um, and this kind of approach, we hope as well, can give us important insights into its politics and its possibility. Because currently the rhetoric is this kind of fully transformed, progressive um, pathway to better cities. And this kind of a lens can give us a more nuanced view on that. So two final points fall out of that for us. The first is, um, again, one that might be quite obvious to us, that UGI rolls out in ways that are much more piecemeal and pro pragmatic than they are cohesive and coherent. So thinking about UGI as incremental rather than this radical disruption to how governance happens, I think is much more appropriate. Again, it's probably an obvious point for us. The second point is the importance of relationality, navigation, and situatedness in determining the political possibilities. Because UGI doesn't have a singular politics. It doesn't really have any political coherency. The spectrum of political ambitions we've found is really, really broad. In real world practice, innovation can be harnessed to progressive transformative agendas, like solving the housing crisis, or generating much more participatory kind of governance. Or it can be appended to more routine improvements in public service delivery. Or it can be appended to a much more starkly competitive urban economic growth agenda. Some of this innovation is about data-driven experimentation in order to create opportunities for tech corporations and, and make that place uh, competitive in that world. So we think there can't be any technocratic assumption that innovation inherently translates into better cities. <coughs> Understanding those politics, we think, needs this looking under the hood of UGI in relation and navigation and situated terms. Because we think that's where we get to see the moments where options are either broadened out or narrowed, where frames are closed in or opened out, where forms of knowledge might be included or excluded, and where new styles of ordinance of governance are actually configured. And all of this, we think, is what has the, the potential to either destabilize existing power relations and uh, political interests, or to re-inscribe them. We think both, both are possible. So we're putting forward this theorization as a kind of, we hope, an analytical resource for evaluating the capacity of UGI, the gaps between its ambitions and action in cities, and for evaluating its political possibilities and its limits. So thanks, Molly. Um, I think we have plenty of time for questions, and there's probably quite a few. Um, not least, how we may relate this to university governments, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe you, if, I think it would be easier if you just sure. field your questions. Yes, certainly. Yep. And if anyone's behind a pillar, just... <laughs> 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 um, thank you very much. It's really, very really interesting. 
Um, I, I, I'm very really interested. So, so, so you, um, you interviewed these these new outfits, and there's this massive disjunction, obviously, between what they say you're supposed to do and what they actually told you is the reality of government's innovation. So, so my question, the obvious one, is how do they reconcile this? made up series of pathways with the messy reality of actually real governance yeah. innovation. I mean, presumably, you're not going to sell people on the idea of a messy no, series of no, non-linear you know, pathways. Is that, most, is that as simple as that? Look, most of the people we, we talked to were, were realists, but also converts. So they were quite passionate about changing the practices. And they came from really, really diverse backgrounds. So they were employed in bureaucrats. We had people. We had a lot of people with design backgrounds. We had people with um, religious studies backgrounds. We had like a really, it's not, it's not public policy people necessarily we were talking to. They, they often had come through some public policy training before they landed here. So they were converts. Um, most of them were in these small units, as I said, that have fairly um, unstable roots to them. You know, most of them were aware that you know a, a mayor changes the quick out. Mm -hmm. um, th their passion, I think, was what carried them through, and they used the pathways. We didn't talk <coughs> much with them about that exact gap. We didn't directly say to them, "Well, these gaps are obviously quite a lot different from your everyday world." And um, they used them as tools, as as um, sort of promotional tools, and and there was a there was a kind of a sales job going on. And one of them talked quite a lot about how um, one of the units was specifically in its approach was there to train other bureaucrats to do it. So not doing projects themselves, but largely being like an academy to give people a skill set. And she talked a lot about often being given the side eye when she walked into a room and people being sent along to do innovation training and all oh, oh, God, you know, and they were given the side eye. Her argument was that when design thinking approaches were used, people often saw the light and would be converted to have a road to Damascus moment and start new conversations. Um, often though, again, we're talking about increments, we're talking about a particular project that might have a relatively short shelf life, um, or it could be bigger than that, could redesign the way a service was being imagined, often by working across uh, departments. So these these pathways were used as tools, mm. I think, to to trigger new conversations. So is there a sense then that the the pathways is real and true, but messy contingencies are an impediment if people just saw the light. But then the pathways would open up and. I think the pathways were more used to convince them upstairs. That these projects and these units were worth sticking with, huh. and that your your street bureaucrats were more like, yeah, we take what we can use from this. Some of it's great, huh. but you know, there's a realism to. The so they're using pathways relationally. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, plugging them in where they need them, where they can get something from them, huh. and you know, you'd often see those. Like, a lot of exhibitions were held, a lot of, of showcases um, that would use the language, the buzzwords. I mean, there is this great trade in, in buzzwords. So we almost had to go away and learn vocabulary to be able to nod at the right moments in the interviews. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much. Really, really interesting. And, uh, my mind kept going back to the, uh, the yes minister still, you know, the, the struggle between the elected officials and those of the and the bureaucrats. Yes. You know, cunning ways to get their own way. You know, but uh, Trace and I were just having a sidebar conversation so he said, you, is she talking about urban or is she talking about universities? <laughs> <laughs> and so um, really, I guess the, the, the question I'm getting to is, you know, um, is this unique to urban governance or can this be informed and can this inform other types of governance, regional governance, university governance, health governance? Yeah, I think it definitely can. I think, and, and a lot of the reports if you look at the, the kind of epistemic community, it's got a kind of a, an urbanizing trajectory through it. So it started out in more general public sector innovation. And then kind of turn to the urban has has come about 
as sort of cities has, have risen to the surface internationally as this sort of appropriate scale with the political capacity to apply certain solutions to big problems that might not be urban at all, you know, like climate change, for instance, or not exclusively urban. And I think what we've seen over the last probably five years or more is that kind of tunnel, channeling, channeling, channeling of this funneling is what I think, you know, funneling those reports um, into a more urban focused ones. And um, so that we were increasingly seeing the big international bodies like the OECD and the UN talking about cities as the mechanism, and particularly mayors and municipalities as a mechanism to, to deliver all of this. And they're, they're part and parcel of build, trying to build these peer-to-peer -peer networks between cities to trade these best practices and, and so on. And it, it's, it's an interesting, this is kind of a digression way, but for, for a theory that is very much about creating the space to fail safely, almost none of these reports talks about actual things that have failed. They get quickly past the failure to what was learned to the success that follows. So there's this kind of, sort of schizophrenic approach with the idea of failure that happens here. Um, that probably has a parallel in the university world as well. Jump in on that because one of the questions that I had written there was about failure. Um, so, so yeah, that doesn't surprise me about the the public-facing documents that they will move as much as they'll make um, creating space, safe space for failure. They'll make that a sort of a talking point and a sort of shaming <coughs> kind of way, but they'll actually go past quite quickly realities of failure. Um, but beyond that, there's, there's been work done in, in urban geography and other, other disciplines recently about, about failure and about how failure is, is inherent to all policy making. Mm. But then there's also the kind of um, popular narrative in, in sort of Silicon Valley tech bro circles about, about failure as being, um, you know, it's, it, the capturing it almost as part of their identity that failure is good and destroying things and breaking things and moving fast and all that and um, which often is a very sort of um, it's a very sort of like like masculinist kind of tough guy narrative of I'm strong enough to fail kind of, kind of thing. Um, so, so which is a lot of ways saying that, that failure and, and its and its role in these narratives can be quite complex sometimes. So I mean, we already touched on it there, but could you could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Like, is it in reality is failure a thing real? That we, in reality they just don't want to touch. It, it is more it is more that than you would imagine from how failure is presented in all of these reports. Failure in the reports is seen as a strength. You fail, you fail fast, you fail early, you learn, you move on. You get the second fail well, fail often. And some of that startup lingo is really powerful in there. And they use, they trade in, in um, all sorts of techniques that come from the software development world mm. as well. Some of them do that. Um, they do talk a bit about having the unit as a safe space because nobody wants to fail with public money. Mm -hmm. um, the actual money involved in lots of these, of these initiatives is not huge generally, unless it's coming from work generally in work or other philanthropies who have funded these innovation teams in, in loads of cities. Um, there's a significant amount of money there, but often the money is, is very contained. And even then, there's a reluctance to, to fail very often with it. And if they do fail, they have to very quickly parlay that into the success that follows. Mm. Um, but in, in very constrained context where there's not much money around, they do spend a lot of money on messaging their success. Of a lot of money with elaborate reports. And um, <coughs> they, they all be, they're kind of templated, you can almost find and replace bits to go in for them. They be quite sort of numbing to read after a while. Um, but yet yeah, they still have to they have to succeed at some point. And it's really hard because much of it is project based. It is actually quite hard to translate the learnings. If you have a project, 
you have time limited to funding for that project, it fails, you often run out of the money to do it again to get to the failure point. So it's difficult to transfer the learnings from that into another project because the learnings are probably going to be fairly, fairly specific. Um, so it is, it's a really good, you could, you could do a lot of work just about this figure of failure in, in, and how it's managed. You know, on the one hand, it's the poster child, on the other hand, it's hidden and dressed up success and sent back out very quickly. about the problems that these units are trying to solve and where who guides those problem that problematization is there is it from more formal urban governance is it from the epistemic community that exists around you like this is an urban problem that your city has and that you should try to solve or is it more self-generated like you go out and look for problems <laughs> to to solve it's, i'm just curious about that and it's in some ways it's all of the above yeah. which i think is really quite interesting in some there are explicit um moments to recruit problems so in, in the italian case i mentioned there's a yearly process where the local government sits down with these six communities across the city and they get a list of problems that that community wants to solve that's what they work on for two or three years. In other instances, the office has been funded by a foundation or philanthropy, and they might have made an application for a particular problem, or the philanthropy might suggest a particular problem that needs working out. Or the philanthropy might just suggest an approach and say, you apply it to whatever your local problems are. So often, or it can be in the US ones, but often whatever the mayor was interested in, that's what they worked on. Um, and, and as a result of that, you get this really diverse scope and scale of imagination of what a problem is. Like in one instance, it was literally how to collect dog poo more efficiently. In another, it was how to create the model of housing provision um, so that we can provide affordable housing. So the scale is really, really different. And some of that comes back to the question of failure. Some of them will simply not try things that were really difficult because of the failure. Others would say, right, we, we know the fairly simple solution we can do better on the dog group. So let's do that one and we have a success story. So, so in some regards, while on one hand these innovation units have been a really productive entry point for us, they are so diverse. Sometimes I worry about the categories. Is it, if they're so diverse, is holding them in one um, I think there's a whole lot of work. There's so many work done around this so far. I think it's, it's, it can do us for now, but we might have to deconstruct that category later on. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. And then we'll make people bigger first. I'm curious um, to know more about, about the UGI models and is, it, is any part of them responding or absorbing critiques of urban governance of before? Mm -hmm. And if so, what critiques and then how does that manifest in their, you know, the appearance that you described about this stagist yeah. model? Lots of them do from, come from a critique of insufficient inclusiveness. So, part oh, of that's it. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a good thing, right? Like, so, that, so many of them move towards co-production type models or central to design thinking is that you start with the user. So if, you're, if your problem is that um, people can't access a certain type of service to meet their needs well in a, in a municipality, the design thinking approach would say, well, let's bring it, let's start with the users. Let's find out what the problems are. Let's find out how we might completely redesign the pipeline for this service. And that can mean sort of blowing it apart and bringing in other departments and really rethinking what the service need actually is. So that can be an end result of this wider type of inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it is also um, about th this very, if there is a strong thrust from above through this, from the OECD, the UN, yeah. the philanthropies, it's often about data having better data, which takes us back to kind of technological entry point. So having evidence-based policy and, and doing the, 
having data to understand. So there is this kind of technologist take that comes in as well. And then that gets also used to measure the outputs that get reported in the reports as the success stories as well. So having data to monitor and measure what we achieve is a huge part of this as well. But actually, it's a corollary to a lot of these questions. I'm just, I'm kind of, from a, this is not any area of my specialization, so from someone just trying to understand conceptually how we're talking about BGI, I'm wondering if it helps analytically to distinguish it between, like, a logic of innovation literally, so people whose motivational intention is to change, versus like a marketing function, which I think happens a lot, where the intention never is to change, it's, it's to manage and be able to present a new ideological front to doing the same thing in terms of managing the ungovernable. So is there a way that, because it might have multiple valences based on the relational and situational unfolding of any particular UGI program, that there's actually internal differentiation that can be articulated in the conceptualization of this theory? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a really great question. And I think, I think the kind of totally cynical use of innovation as a brand is, um, we haven't seen a lot of it in the people we spoke to. Most of them were middle level bureaucrats who are genuinely passionate and committed to what they see as positive improvement. Now, whether they're actually addressing symptoms rather than s structures that are causing problems is a, is a whole other question in a way. In the remit that they can work, they're generally um, seeing the moment as positive um, and often very kind of clear-eyed and, and politically um, clever about realizing that we can deliver certain things to this, we can work things or if we use it. They tended not to, they weren't cynical about how they used the term innovation. They weren't just using it to get money or to um, control a, a problem in a different way necessarily. They, they were believers in a way, often. And that's, I guess, because these are, there's a self fulfilling prophecy to who's going to work in these units, right? That people who agree with. Um, we looked a little bit at um, the philanthropies that fund this and really drive innovations and produce the important innovation ideology. Um, I think we, we need to do more work there. What we found there with the major, the, the biggest philanthropy that, that funds this work directly, which is Bloomberg, they hold back really strongly on defining the problems to be looked at. They push the process, but core to that process is data. And that produces a particular way of seeing the problem. Like, and, and it produces a certain set of solutions and kind of rules out other kinds of solutions. So you, you can read some of that sort of change everything so nothing changes in that. Mm -hmm. Less so, I think, in the middle of the world. That's a good question. Thank you. There's one more. Maybe, sorry, maybe you can push No, I don't have a spot. I'm curious who this new citizen subject is that's created these new labs and mm -hmm. is it very different from the new liberal kind of it's it, that's a really great question. I think it really varies. There's such a variety in the the way that this is citizen is approached across the examples. In the in the Italian example we looked at, that was the most strident about their very purpose for innovation was citizen participation. But it was in a context of very little resources, so it was in austerity. So what they were doing was they were trying to reproduce urban commons and use, use deploy citizens to manage these new urban cities that the citizens wanted. So they were involved in things like um, you know, renovating decaying urban halls into new cultural centres in the community. But then that community had to run those centres themselves, those sort of things. But a really, like a genuine kind of levelling off of influence and engagement for the citizens. In other instances, there were more kind of co-production, you know, bring the, bring the service users in from the beginning, 
get them to help us understand what service would suit them better. There's a real question there about what was being asked of those citizens, the skill sets were, that were demanded of those citizens, and to what extent could they perform in the way they were being asked to, to get the most out of this, this kind of relationship. So there's a whole spectrum there, which comes back to, I think, my, my end point about what the political possibilities of this are. Because they are not coherent. They, they can be things that we might all sign on to as a social justice advance, or they can be reproducing different kinds of subjectivities and outcomes that we have much more squeamishness about. And I think that, that gets determined in the, well, I would say this because it's my theory, the relationality, <coughs> the navigation, and the situation. Um, uh, I, it's more a framing, framing question, and, and, and it, I'm sure it affects my um, the, the, the lived grasp I have of the work that you're trying to do. But I'm really interested in, in the way in which you centered these units mm. in understanding the theorization of actual UGI. Yeah. So my question is, well, why do you need those? Um, if they're just giving you a load of bullshit that doesn't actually apply on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondarily, I suppose, are there any effects of those frameworks, those pathways, as they collide with this? You know, so is there actually a, can you trace an effect that these innovation frameworks or ideologies have on, on the ground? Is that part of the project? Um. We, it, it's less part of the project simply because getting right through to kind of outcomes, it, it wasn't something we had the scope to do. I think it absolutely needs to be done as a project to look at well, what, what do these actually achieve? Because even though they speak all the time about monitoring and measuring their outcomes, um, that was very modest in how it was done. And it was always just in simple things you could count, like how many people used a particular interface to access something. Was, was taken as the, the improvement, the yeah. metric improvement. So, um, so, what I would say about the effect of these units is that it changes through time. So often their purpose is to be temporary. It's to stress and demonstrate these new approaches in order to be infused across the institution so that with time you shouldn't leave the unit because you have done the cultural conversion of the whole institution. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. That's a big part of them. And, and some of them has, have that expressed, you know, we shouldn't need to exist forever. And mm -hmm. um, others just want to stay in their unit because they're, as they said, we're the cool kids that get to the cool stuff. <laughs> so they get to experiment and they get to say, like, it's not just about filling the potholes, we get to try new things, so we get to go out and um, go to global conferences and, and meet with um, philanthropies and not for profits and do cool stuff. Um, so, and, and all of that, I think, for us, that there's a real question around this kind of project approach that leads back to accountability questions about what does this all do to our governance. And um, most of them have a, a public value um, purpose in what they're doing. So, lot, they would probably be signed up to by a broad constituency, but they don't have to prove that constituency before they get to play around. So, in this moment at least, I think this will change. We're in kind of a curious moment in this flowering of these units and, and what they're seen to be able to do. And but it's definitely a thing, you know, we saw the growth, the growth of them. It's a thing because it allows the use of buzzwords and the, the technologies and the techniques. Um, I think tracing its implications. We wouldn't attempt to do that on the, the international scale that we have. You probably need to go go up and look at particular ones and trace them through really carefully. I could ask one last one if no one else has any. Um, so planning used to and a lot from it suggested that these things were necessarily weren't necessarily good, but they, planning um, and governance attitudes used to be in the 20th century a lot around the, the idea of comprehensiveness, right? 
Okay, so comprehensive plans, ten-year plans, integrated with the more recent term, 20 years ago, 10 years ago now in Britain was joined up, everything, everything joined up, right? Um, and there's problems with that. And you look at the other, the other uh, phrase that came to mind was Daniel Burnham, the, the architect in Chicago at the end of the 19th century, whose famous phrase was make no, make no small plans, right? So, so there's that context for, for a sort of devil's advocate question, which is, um, and you kind of touch, started to touch on some of this with some of the other answers, but are these things, these, um, these units, are they, are they busyness machines? <laughs> I think what they are often is their, their take, because the production of these units as innovation units sort of suggests that local governments were not innovating previously. Mm. You know, whereas, whereas many of them were trying their guts out to try new things, to do things and improve things, but it, it didn't get called innovation. This mm -hmm. is kind of a moment where it's, it's a style in one way, it's also, it is a brand, it is unleashing resources both from philanthropies and sometimes from within um, the city itself, not often huge resources, but some. Um, it's allowing these cities to scan the horizon internationally for who's putting money up to do these things and to strategically use that. Um, and, and I think the sort of Bloomberg sponsoring of, of iTeams all over the world has, has been an important part of that. So it's probably too unfair to say business machines. I think that it, they are a, a, a fairly unwieldy category. They vary in scale, but most of them are really quite small. Like we're talking fewer than 12 people usually, mm. um, often six people. You know, so they are really quite small. Given their size, the, the kind of noise that they've made, I think is amplified by this extent community mm. and just, you know, they're, they're onto a thing that's trending. Um, um, and as I said, some of them are not actually doing projects, but are there as training units to infuse culture change. So, so what they do is really quite, quite varied as well. Um, but probably too harsh to call them as much. Yeah. But I'll be so harsh. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm the, like, you yourself said that the lessons from one program don't necessarily have the ability to be transferred into the, the efforts of another program, right? So, so what are we, what are we doing? It, it to me is another one of the real tensions. So there's a real tension about what failure does. Mm. There's another real tension around scaling and replicating. Because all of the, all of the discourse is about pro producing solutions that are replicable and can be taken on elsewhere and scaled through that. And that I think connects back to the kind of data-driven logic behind data techniques that maybe can be translated from place to place. Mm -hmm. But you know, we know that's really tortured, the idea of transferring an idea from one to another. Yeah, really, really tortured. And I think it's completely mired in navigations and different kind of reconstructions and relations as well. Um, but again, you know, there's, a, there's lots of inconsistencies in, in the idea as it's put forward. And I think that failing and the replicating and scaling are two you know, what scaling is for and, and why it needs to be scaled. How do you how do you bring the question of scaling back down to all the questions of context? Um, so so what can scale might be um, often a technological approach that that might have uses in a number of different contexts. But you know getting that into place, even that even getting that into place will always have to go through the processes and it might land somewhere a little bit different to how it was imagined. Thanks. Looks like we're at, uh, we're at a good point. So uh, before before I ask you to join me in thanking Pauline again, let me just say that uh, Pauline, we're lucky to have Pauline visiting us here for two weeks. So she's been here this week. Uh, she'll be here next week. So two weeks goes, I guess. Um, and you know, feel free, I imagine, to to reach out. And if you if you want to have more of a chat. 
with her either here on campus or downtown or in East Lab, uh, if you want to if you want to continue these conversations. Um, also, if you were still up for it, uh, we're maybe going to go maybe you and I at least to go for a beer at four o'clock today, as the works. But beer craft on campus. So we'll go over at four-ish and if anyone else fancies coming for a beer and a full of chat and the nice weather, feel free to do so. Alright, let's thank you all.